Good morning. It's good to see you guys. How are you? Good. Glad to hear it. It's been a been a good week. I'm glad you're here this morning. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to continue uh, this series called The Big Picture. And in this, we've been walking through the story of God's Word and particularly taking notice of the story that it's telling, the story of God's redemption of mankind through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so uh, that takes us to Matthew chapter 5 this morning. We'll begin um, seeing what it is that Jesus taught. So if you remember last week, we looked at Matthew chapter 4. Jesus moves into the area of Capernaum after John the Baptist arrest. While He's there, He begins to preach. And He says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, Matthew quoted Isaiah 9 there as he's introducing Christ into this area. It's a fulfillment of uh, prophecy from Isaiah chapter 9. And what he's saying is, is that this is, this Christ coming into this area, Christ coming into this area is the dawning of a great light on a people who dwell in darkness. And so we talked a bit about that. These people, like the rest of mankind, made their home in darkness. In fact, it's more than darkness was just merely around them, right? It's that darkness existed inside them. But in God's wonderful kindness, He sends Christ to earth. Christ is born to save His people from their sins, as we see in Matthew chapter 1. A great light then has dawned on darkness. And so now we come to what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount takes up Matthew chapter 5, chapters 5 through 7. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is largely an elaboration, if you will. It's, a, it's an exhortation of what it is that, what, that Christ meant when He says, repent. The Sermon on the Mount is covering this idea of repentance. It's showing what repentance, true repentance, looks like. Now here we will see some of what Jesus said, particularly related to repentance. Uh, and then in the coming weeks, and over the next three weeks, we'll look more at what Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount. So we'll walk through Matthew 5 through 7 over the next few weeks together. Uh, but this big picture series has been all about the story of God's redemption, taking just a look at the totality of Scripture and how it is telling this one story about God's people and how they can come to enjoy God's presence again within God's place for God's purpose. Now, the doctrine of repentance is one foundational stone that must be laid if we are to build our house with God rather than to remain in the darkness which we were born into. So in today's passage, I think we see this. We see that true repentance uh, we see what it consists of, and, and Thomas Watson had this great quote. He's a 17th century Puritan preacher, and he wrote a book called The Doctrine of Repentance, uh, and if you enjoy crying, <laughs> this is a good one to read. If you enjoy coming to bear with the load of sin that's on your back, this is a good one to read. It's, it's one that will help you get a strong sense of who you are apart from Christ, and while we have every need in the world to turn to Christ, but this is what he said about true repentance. He he says true repentance begins in the love of God and ends in the hatred of sin. True repentance begins in the love of God and ends in the hatred of sin. And I'm just going to lay his thought out as our main point uh, today. True repentance begins in the love of God and ends in the hatred of sin. Let me, let me pray for us and then we'll dive into Matthew 5. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Christ Jesus. God, today as we look at the words which He spoke, oh, Father, would You help us come to grips with it? Heavenly Father, would You empower us through Your Spirit to understand it? Lord, help us not to consider these words as folly, as the world is prone to do, but help us to consider these words truth, Your truth, truth which must be understood if we are to know life and life more abundantly. We thank You for Your Son, Jesus, that He died for our sins, that we might be reconciled to you again. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this word now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
So if you recall, at the end of Matthew 4, what we saw was Christ was performing many miracles. But he, was calling, he called his first disciples. He begins to go and teach and perform many miracles. And this is what we read in Matthew 4, 25. It says, And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. So great crowds from all over the area, which means that it would have been comprised of Jews and Gentiles, followed him. Seeing the crowds, Matthew 5, 1, 2. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So, this is where we begin today. We begin with Jesus on a ridge somewhere in the hills, probably most likely believed now to be just to the northwest of this area of Capernaum, which had a great view of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus there sees the crowds. I can imagine he has compassion on them. And he sits down and teaches. This was customary for Jewish teachers, would be to sit down and teach. Jesus doesn't begin his sermon as I might would have been tempted to begin his sermon. If you recall, Jesus had just been preaching in the synagogues of the area. He doesn't begin his sermon with negative criticism of the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious people of that day. Now, there will be time for that, and Jesus will get into that even in this sermon. But he doesn't start there, at least not explicitly. It is implicit, but he starts with this positive note regarding the righteous character, regarding God-given righteous character, but also the blessing that it brings to the life of a believer. So the Pharisees, as, as you know, if you've grown up in church or kind of been around the church world, you've, you've heard the Pharisees dogged on, and, and rightfully so. These were religious people who had no intent to truly be worshiping God. It was all about the appearance of worshiping God. But sometimes the Pharisees become those people over there and people that we couldn't possibly be, and yet we end up being more like them than we realize. So we must be aware of how much We dog on the Pharisees. But the Pharisees were staunch believers in practicing an outward righteousness. That righteousness that looks good to an onlooker. That righteousness that says the right things. The righteousness that practices the right things. Though when he's practicing those things, he's making sure he's practicing those things with everyone looking on. As we'll see in Matthew 6. But their belief was unabashedly a works based salvation. They believed that they were saved because, one, they were Jewish. It was in their bloodline. They believed, two, that they were saved because they practiced these great works. They even added to God's laws. They made God's laws more than what God had intended for them to be. For them, salvation was merely external. It didn't have to take place here. It had to take place out there in the way that we Act. It was about obeying rules and regulations rather than the Father. They thought and they taught that righteousness could be measured by how much you pray, by how much you give, how much you fast, how much you show up for worship. Now again, if we're not careful, these become barometers for our own level of faithfulness, do they not? But Jesus taught about Christian character, specifically Christian character that flows from within a person, meaning this person has something inside of him that's worth flowing out, which is what Christ gets into as he begins to teach on the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of believers. That result is a love for God and a hate for sin. It's a love for God and a hate for sin. It's a despising of the sin that would be an affront to this holy God. So let's look at what Christ teaches now that we kind of understand what's happening here and what he's beginning with. Verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom 
of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Praise God. I couldn't think of a better song to have sung before we got into this, Christ is mine forevermore. I mean, it just utters the heart of the Beatitudes so perfectly. These are known as the Beatitudes. I kind of tipped my hand there. The reason they're known as the Beatitudes, they come from the Latin word for blessed, which is beatus. And from this, we get the word Beatitude. Now, blessed, as we see it here, was a powerful word. Those who were listening would have understood this to be a very powerful thing because it meant divine joy, not just joy, not just happiness, but a divine joy, a perfect, a complete happiness. Now, the word was not used normally for humans. It, was, it described the kind of joy that would be experienced only by gods or those who are dead, blessed, implies a divinely given inner satisfaction and sufficiency that does not depend on outward circumstances or works. Now, notice I said a divinely given inner satisfaction and sufficiency. You will not find blessedness in yourself lest it be divinely given to you. It's impossible. Now, the Beatitudes describe the attitudes that every disciple of Jesus should possess. Notice how True repentance, as we see it here, true repentance begins in the love of God, but it ends in the hatred of sin. Let me, let me show you why we get that here, why we think this works here. Back at 5.3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What's happening in the Beatitudes is a progression of thought. It's a progression of heart change. It's a progression of the disciple as he encounters light for the first time. You see, the poor in spirit are those who recognize the darkness they dwell in. They recognize the darkness they dwell in because they have seen the dawning of a great light in the face of Jesus Christ and his gospel proclamation. You see, the poor in spirit are those who are in need of or recognize their great need for God's help in their lives. Poor in spirit is the kind of attitude that comes when you see that you are spiritually bankrupt before God. You, you are now poor in spirit. Poor in spirit doesn't mean that you have no backbone. It doesn't mean that you're a pushover. It doesn't mean that you have no self-esteem. It doesn't mean that you hate yourself. Poor in spirit is opposite of the world's attitude of self-praise. It's opposite, I dare say, of the world's attitude of self-loathing. It's opposite of self-assertion. It is a right assessment. Poor in spirit is a right assessment of one's sinful state when compared to the utter holiness of God. It's a state of mind and heart that we are encouraged to keep close to us as we walk with God. We are not to forget what it means to be poor in spirit. We are to walk poor in spirit with God. Listen to Romans 12, 3, as Paul's encouraging the church there. He says, for by grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think more highly of himself than you ought to think. Do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. But think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Poor in spirit, sober judgment, understanding who you are. Such people, those who are poor in spirit, will not only be divinely blessed with joy and contentment, it says here they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's theirs. How can the people of God maintain such an attitude? Well, this is how the progression works. Look at four through six. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So how do you maintain 
this poorness of spirit. First, we mourn over our sin. We despise our sin. Love for God leads us to a hatred of our sins because they are an offense, an offense against the holy God. Sin causes decay. It causes destruction. Sin brings death. It brings sadness, mourning, weeping. And that sadness is meant to direct you to God where your longing for forgiveness and spiritual healing is found in God alone. Christians are not to be the kind of people who cover up their sins. We're not to be the kind of people who defend our sins or the sins of others. For that would be an ungodly attitude. The only thing that can truly cover your sins, here's why it's covering your own sin is wrong and faulted. The only thing that can truly cover your sins, the only defense you will have for your sins is that which comes from the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. And that righteousness is given to you by grace, through faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. His righteousness becomes yours. Your sin becomes His Mourning, mourning over your sins then is what brings the comfort of God. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. I heard a sermon on this a couple of weeks ago, and gosh, I've just been chewing on it ever since. Incredible passage, 2 Corinthians 1. Anyway, these couple of verses here I think apply. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort. Everybody say, all comfort. How much of the comfort? Some? All. The the preacher I heard made this point. He said, if there is comfort to be had, true comfort, it comes from God only. All comfort is His comfort. All true comfort comes from God. There are faulty comforts we chase. There are wrong comforts we pursue. But true comfort comes from God only. He is the God of all comfort. And listen to what he does. 2 Corinthians 1.4 Who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You see, you've received comfort from God. You receive comfort from God in your mourning. This is what Jesus is saying. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted by God. Our mourning, then, leads to meekness, leads to humility, gentleness. But meekness is not a weakness. Meekness does not mean that you are weak. The word used to describe meek is the same word that was used by the Greeks to describe a horse that had been broken. It refers to power that is under control, power that is under authority. Romans 1 provides a picture of what humans look like without such control, without such brokenness. Let's look at Romans 1, 21 through 31. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. I'm not sure there's a more sobering passage in Scripture than the the rest of what we're about to read. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Now look what happened. Claiming to be wise... They became fools. They exchanged the glory of God, of the immortal God, for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. What's the indictment here? 
Idolatry is the indictment. A worshiping of creation rather than the Creator. It doesn't end there. Look at verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They were gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. It's a frightening thing. It's a frightening thing to observe when God gives men up to the lust of their hearts. Someone who is meek understands who they are. They understand who they are in light of who God is, and that breeds meekness. The, the meek are ones who trust the God of heaven and earth to accomplish his will. The meek do not assert themselves over the will of God. They submit themselves to his rule. They submit themselves to his reign in their lives. And so they will inherit the earth, Jesus says. What does that mean? What well, means... At the very least, they will dwell on the new heavens and the new earth in total peace with God when Christ returns. It'll be theirs. And so the mourners become the meek. The meek become those who hunger and thirst for God's righteousness. And we see that they will be satisfied. They will be filled with all righteousness. And then Jesus gets into now what this filling looks like. What do these people look like who have been filled or satisfied with righteousness? Matthew 5, 7 through 9. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. You see, you experience the mercy of God when you encounter Jesus Christ. This, this is mercy from on high. Let me remind you, I, I know I do frequently, but Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when we looked like that Romans 1 people, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with Christ and seated us with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. See, God sending Christ to the earth is rich mercy for us. We talked about this last week, about how that people dwelling in darkness, it was mercy that there was an, even, an opportunity for repentance. It was mercy from God. He would have been completely justified to leave humanity in their sin forever, destined for damnation and hell for all eternity. This would be right. This would be just. But God in rich mercy, God in great grace, enters in through his son Jesus, enters into our mess. 
saves us through the death of his own son. That by believing in him, we might be right with God. Just as Christ is right with God. Enjoying that perfect fellowship. And so as a result of rich mercy, in Acts 15, what we see is that we receive a clean heart. The quote there is, God made no distinction between us and them, between the Jews and the Gentiles. God made no distinction having cleansed their hearts by faith. This clean heart, which is received by the mercy of God, reconciles you to God. You receive peace with God because of the death of Jesus Christ. God then is now both just and justifier. This is how we keep from looking at God and saying that's not fair. God loves us as he loves his own son. God loves us as he loves his own son because we are united to Christ by grace through faith, seated with him in heavenly places both already and not yet. Already spiritually, not yet physically, but one day. One day. And so Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Having received such great mercy from God, we now share that mercy with others. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. They will receive mercy. You see, when you understand mercy in that way, and and I'm here to tell you folks, you will not fully understand mercy until heaven. But when you get a glimpse of mercy, when you get a glimpse of your darkness, and you get a glimpse of God intervening in your darkness in His own Son, Jesus Christ, you are overwhelmed with the goodness and mercy of God. I I dare to say you are undone by the mercy of God. Pride is stripped away. Ego falls to the side. And, and you, th- there's no way such people can hold on to grudges, bitterness, unforgiveness toward others. Why? Because you are a great sinner and you have sinned against a perfectly holy God and yet he has shown you mercy. And so you recognize that when another great sinner sins against a great sinner in yourself, you show mercy because you recognize, man, it could have been far worse. I deserve far worse, but I've received magnificent grace from on high. And so there's nothing in you that says, I'm going to withhold mercy and grace because God's given it to me. Ephesians 4.32, Paul writing there encourages the Ephesian church to be exactly this. Be kind to one another, he says. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. How? As God in Christ forgave you. You see, you extend a mercy that's not yours, and that's how you're able to do it. You extend a grace that you didn't have to produce to others. And that's where the strength comes to do it. You forgive others because you have been forgiven. And so it's not even you who's having to do it. You're just recognizing that I've received this from God and I extend it to others. It gets into this, blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. You see, we seek to keep our hearts pure that we might see God in this life. We might experience God in life. That we might one day come face to face with God. 
But again, purity is not something you're producing. Purity of heart comes from leaning into the perfection of Christ Jesus. It's not something you have to make happen. But purity of heart is maintained through confession. It's maintained through repentance. It's confessing that I have sinned against God. It's confessing that I have sinned against my neighbor. It's repenting of it because my love for God, his love for me, makes me hate that sin. But brothers and sisters, there are sins you're committing daily that you are unaware of. We must be leaning on the righteousness of Christ if we hope to be pure in heart. A heart that is running headlong into sinful desires. A heart that is running headlong into those things which God says, do not do. That heart will be troubled by many, many afflictions. And here's the thing, the afflictions are grace. When you're troubled by affliction in your sin, it's the same kind of troubling my father's hand used to cause my behind when I was sinning. It's the, it's the affliction of correction. It breeds, it breeds repentance. It breeds obedience. But Romans 1 is a warning to you that that may not last forever. God may remove his hand at some point and you will run headlong into your desires. And you'll get exactly what you wanted. But at the end, it won't be anything like what you hoped for. It'll be eternal brokenness. Eternal separation from God. Eternally existing under the wrath of God. I urge you to repent today. Today. Turn from your sin today. Jesus is saying the one that seeks to purify himself through confession of sin, repentance from sin, faithfulness to his commands, that person will experience the power of God in his life. You'll see God. One way that happens is the next thing. Blessed are those. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Wow. One way you see the power of God on display in your life is you become a peacemaker. This, again, this isn't like a, a world peace idea, right? Right? This is way better than that. Once you were Romans level, Romans 1 level fallen. But now the great light of the gospel of Jesus has dawned and it is spreading into your whole life. That light is shining and you are finding that darkness and you are ridding yourself of it by the Spirit of God putting to death the deeds of the flesh through the Spirit. And in that moment, in those moments, you're experiencing more and more of peace with God. And now you're moved into the space of being a peacemaker. You are proclaiming peace with God to other people. You become, in a very real, very, very real sense, a conduit of God's peace in a troubled world. You bring mercy, you bring purity, you bring peace into every area of your life and that touches the lives of others. That promotes peace in the lives of others. Peace with God. And so peacemakers are called the sons of God. Why? Because they reflect the heart of God. The heart of God in Christ Jesus was to promote peace, to reconcile Man, we are his children. Jesus lays something else out here. <laughs> and it still hinges on the word blessed. 
Jesus teaches one more blessing to be obtained by his followers. But, but hear me, this blessing comes to them riding on the back of persecution. This is a blessing that you can only know in persecution. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Further elaborating on that, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You see, being a fully devoted follower of Jesus will absolutely result in persecution. Notice that this blessing belongs to those who are falsely or wrongly accused on Jesus' account. It is quite possible to simply be a jerk who calls himself a Christian. And in so doing, you will bring persecution into your life. You will invite persecution into your life. In fact, you will be convinced in the middle of that persecution that that is a result of your faithfulness when the truth is it's a result of your jerkiness. Which is why the other seven Beatitudes must be paid attention to. We must pay attention. It's hard for the poor in spirit to be a jerk. It's hard for those who have received mercy to be a jerk. It's hard for the pure in heart to be a jerk. It's hard for peacemakers to be a jerk. These are all things that God rots in us, brings about in us through his spirit. But to the ones who are living faithfully before God, to the ones who are living as described in the verses that preceded these, that person will endure the persecution of mankind. It's inevitable. Our world is not a friend to God, in case you were unaware. Nor is our world a friend to God's people. But God's people rest in knowing this. It's what Jesus told Saul in his encounter with him. When Saul falls to the ground there, and Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul was persecuting God's people. But that persecution is against Christ himself. And this is where we know we are blessed. There's conflict between us and the world because there's conflict between God and the world. The kingdom of heaven belongs to these faithful disciples of Jesus. Who says the kingdom of heaven is theirs? There's a reward for faithful followers of Jesus that is beyond this life that Jesus is saying it's, it's yours. And their eyes are fixed on it. This is how they endure the persecution of the wicked. These people are in good company. Jesus says the prophets before you were persecuted. Jesus himself is going to be persecuted to the point of death on a cross. The only, mind you, the only truly unjust killing that has ever happened in the history of mankind. And so Jesus says, here's what such people are like. Look at verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall it saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light. To all in the house. You know, this was before you had a light switch in the wall that would light up your room. You take a lamp and you would set it in the middle of a room up high enough to give light to the whole house. 
In the same way, Jesus says, you let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I think Paul had this in mind when he wrote Ephesians 2. That you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Created for good works which God has prepared beforehand. See, Jesus uses two metaphors which really still mean a lot to us today. One was salt, the other light. Salt, as you know, is beneficial to us in so many ways or at least beneficial to most of us. I have a sodium issue, so. (laughs) It's beneficial as a preservative, really beneficial as seasoning. McDonald's would be nothing without salt. (laughs) Jesus encourages his followers to stay the course. Your salt. Don't lose your saltiness. How? How does salt become less salty? It partners with other things. It's made impure. The followers of Christ are going to lose saltiness when they partner with the world, when they partner with sin. Jesus is saying, walk in these beatitudes. Jesus later reveals in teaching that you can walk in such things through the power of the Spirit, which will be yours, he says, once I go away. And so now that he's gone, we get to live by the power of the Spirit. It's what makes us alive. And for what purpose? Well, one, for your own preservation, (laughs) for your own seasoning, but two, so that you can also preserve and season this world. Light, it's essential to seeing in darkness, right? Light transforms a room. Gospel light in the lives of God's people transforms the world. Do not not suppress the light that is in you. Do not fear the world, rather shine brightly. I encourage you, shine brightly for the kingdom of heaven. And you shine as one who has been saved by God from your sins. You shine as one who has received a new life in Christ Jesus through the Spirit. And when others see the gospel light that's shining in you through your good works, which is definitely, definitely in context, the Beatitudes. Definitely in context. It's the rest of this sermon, which we'll look at in a few weeks. Over the next few weeks, I should say. When you do that, those good works, you give glory to your Heavenly Father. Because such good works cannot be produced on your own. Such good works are different than that of what the Pharisees were trying to produce. Such good works come from the inside outward rather than just being on the outside. Your good works, which are not merely a result of the gospel, but carry the gospel with them, point sinners to Jesus Christ. And so then God is glorified. As we read this passage, as we read these Beatitudes, we find that they represent a life. They represent a a worldview. They represent a doctrine that is radically different and entirely, entirely opposed to the world. The world praises pride, not humility. The world endorses sin, especially if you can get away with it. The world is at war with God, while God is seeking to reconcile his enemies and make them his children. We must expect to be persecuted if we're living as God commands us to live. We must expect it. Brothers and sisters, hear me. The kingdom of heaven has come in the light of Jesus Christ. By faith in him, you are united to him in his mission. 
to spread gospel light into all the earth, to seek and save the lost. So I ask you today, will you consider these Beatitudes? Will you think through them? Asking yourself questions like, am I poor in spirit? Have I been mournful over my sins? Do I possess a meekness? Would I consider myself, would my wife consider me hungry and thirsty for righteousness? Am I merciful as I've received mercy? Is my heart pure? Would my coworkers call me a peacemaker? Would my spouse call me a peacemaker? Would my children call me a peacemaker? Am I afraid of persecution for living holy before the Lord in this day? Am I subject to compromise so that I don't have to endure hardship for Christ? Have I wrongly brought on persecution because I'm a jerk? I ask you, brothers and sisters, are there any of those that you're ignoring in your life, that you're forgetting, that you've forgotten? Which one of those is the Spirit of God revealing to you right now as one to walk in obedience with God in? I urge you, Commit yourself to him today. Commit yourself to God today in Christ Jesus. Submit yourself like that broken horse to the rule and reign of God. That's the life of divine blessedness. That's what it means to be blessed. It starts with true repentance. True repentance begins in the love of God and ends in the hatred of sin. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, I thank you for your word today. I thank you, Lord, for being with us now. Father, would you help us to be obedient to the teachings of Christ? We thank you for these pronouncements of blessedness, divine joy from on high. God, I've spent the better part of my Christian life trying to achieve those things apart from your Spirit's help. thinking a lot like a Pharisee. Father, would you forgive me for that? God, would you help us to know power under control, power under control, under the control of your hand, Father, we love you. Forgive us. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us for forgetting these things. Father, would you help my brothers and sisters here and and me also be sensitive to your spirit now, to hear his instruction, to hear conviction. Father, would you, would you help us not to further harden our heart? Would you help us 
not continue to trade creator worship for creation worship in our lives. Father, there's people in here, maybe watching the line, who don't know you today. God, I, I beg you for mercy on them. Grace to, that saves. Would you grant them faith in Christ? Would you save them from their sins? God, would you prevent them from running headlong into their sinful desires? Would you open their eyes to Christ? Open their eyes to the gospel. Help them to know you. Help them to be at peace with you. Would you justify them by faith? Father, be with us now as we worship, as we pray, as we confess sin. Give us the the strength to repent, to walk in repentance, to bear the fruit of repentance in our lives. Help us not to give lip service today, Father. Save us from ourselves. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.